Thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Heather Shank. I'm the city planner for the city of Concord. Uh, we are here tonight to review portions of uh, the first draft, the first phase of the update to the zoning code. Um, we have our consultant here, Lee Einsweiler, as well as Ken Howard from Code Studio to uh, review the submission and also just answer questions. We've got uh, our existing code, our existing zoning map, excuse me, up on the wall, and then uh, a proposed district code map up there to the right, um, which we're happy to talk to you about. Um, this right now that we're going over is portions of phase one. So basically everything that's in color on that map on the right is what is included in phase one. The little pieces you may see uh, that are blank, they're white, they say phase two on them, those are the things we'll be dealing with next, and those include most of the performance districts. Um, so right now what we have is a proposal that uh, we're still, we're working with, we're tweaking, and, and we're here to basically say, hey, this is, this is what we've come up with so far, uh, and some of the numbers and things that, that still need to be worked on. Um, it's very much an, an ongoing um, proposition, but uh, we want to explain to you how this works, and maybe a summary of why we're doing this and what we're hoping to accomplish here. Um, I will turn it over to Lee. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you, Heather. I appreciate it. So thank you all for coming out tonight. It's uh, so beautiful. I'd rather be in a lawn chair somewhere than here. Uh, so I'm, I'm truly grateful that, that at least somebody uh, came to say hello to us. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, why we're here tonight, what we're trying to achieve, how this code can get at the things that we're trying to achieve, and then what does that actually look like when you look at the individual code pages. So we're going to hopefully teach you how to read this draft and how to understand how it might apply in your neighborhood or to projects that might happen near you. So going through why are we here? Um, part of uh, the challenge is that today's zoning was put in place after many of the buildings and much of the platting was already done here, right? There was built community here, fabric, lots, blocks, streets, all of those things that were built before the zoning. Then the zoning that was put in place didn't even vaguely match what was on the ground. So when people ask to do things, many times you have to get a variance to improve one of the older homes. Not necessarily in one of the newer neighborhoods, but if you're trying to add an addition on or, or somehow modify your house in one of the older neighborhoods, uh, it typically is going to take a variance and you're, you're going to be called non-conforming. Um, residents are often limited in what they can do on their lot because if you're not conforming then theoretically you don't get to do new exciting things because you don't conform. So first fix the old things and then maybe we'll talk about you being able to do some new things. New homes are inadvertently perhaps uh, encouraged to be out of character by some of the metrics that are applied. The numbers that are applied about lot size and area and setback and whatever else are actually encouraging you to do some wrong-headed things. And I'll show you an example in a short while. Housing options in Concord, I don't think anybody uh, 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 here doesn't feel the pinch of this issue. At all price points, there is very little available in your marketplace. It's a wonderful problem to have, perhaps, from one perspective, but it is keeping you from, from uh, being able to hang on to people. It is making people commute for a long distances to get here for jobs. It's a bit of a challenge to your community, but you have a very tight marketplace. We are also working not just on the residential areas, which is most of the conversation tonight, admittedly, but we're also working on uh, the rules that would apply to downtown and the neighborhood centers. Now, downtown is in fairly good shape. You've been keeping that code up. There's been activity there. You've been responding to that. But in some of the outlying areas, um, uh, we're, we're kind of having issues that uh, would be nice if we didn't have. One of the biggest problems is that when you add development, in our minds, new development should improve the quality of the community, not detract from it. And that's been a challenge lately in the outlying areas, the, the neighborhood uh, centers especially. The sites get focused on parking and convenience rather than on people and placemaking. Um, buildings have been torn down, especially in this nearby area, 
to uh, produce surface parking when in fact probably if we went and counted all the available parking spaces there's probably enough here they're just a little further away um, and in in some of the outlying places sometimes there the uh, sidewalks are disconnected or of, of poor quality as they were originally installed and we're we're living with with decades worth of of uh, older infrastructure in some of those settings. So we'll show you uh, how some of these play out. So right now, pretty much everybody's neighborhood zoning says is substandard or non-conforming. We did an analysis throughout the community. You can go back and dig up the assessment on the project website uh, that, that looked at some specific neighborhoods, but basically in lots and lots of places, stuff is too close to the lot line, the lot size is too small, it's too narrow, it doesn't meet the standards in some fashion and would be deemed by today's ordinance non-conforming. Even though we like the character of these areas and we like the houses just fine and the neighborhoods are fine, the zoning says they're not fine. So this is one of the things that we're hoping to cure. How does that happen? Well, right now, you might have that lovely house we were just looking at and its little garage and it's non-conforming as to side setback for the house and the garage the lot area is too small the lot width is inadequate it does meet the other side setback and the front setback and the rear setback but really if you wanted to add on to this house or or kind of cure some of the problems associated with it the easiest thing to do is just to buy the next lot over and build this monster which actually meets all of the rules and you didn't necessarily want in the character of your neighborhood right so that's drawn up there on the wall and you can look at it again in more detail if you want it's perhaps a little light on the screen here the options are also limited because housing is somewhat expensive here in the scheme of things not if you're coming from california but if you're coming from most anywhere else housing is expensive here and it's relatively unavailable whether, whether you're talking about renting or buying uh, or, or, or whatever else you might be talking about. Your options also as the homeowner themselves, the person who's got into the system already, your options may be limited. You want to upgrade your home, you want to try to age in place, you want to generate a little rental income, you want multi-generational living, whether it's your kids or your parents who are coming to live with you. Often that requires work on variances and other things before you can invest in your property. If you're non-conforming, the flexibility is quite limited for what you can do. And the accessory uh, unit and the conversion processes that are in your current code are a little bit dysfunctional. They haven't generated tons of accessory units across the community. Uh, we haven't seen wholesale conversion of entire neighborhoods. Those rules are um, uh, ungainly enough that those choices aren't being used right now. So even homeowners that are here are somewhat constrained in their options. You've been choosing in some settings convenience over community. This is right down the street here. I think everybody recognizes it. Wouldn't it have been lovely if they'd left space here in front of that parking lot for a modest building? Um, wouldn't have had to have been terribly deep, wouldn't have had to have been terribly big, but I would rather look at another building than the parking lot. And we've chosen that having one extra row of cars or whatever else was a better answer for us in this setting. Um, uh, so there are challenges like this throughout the, the sort of in-town area. Um, here's one of those outlying places that is kind of missing its people components, right? This building is not terribly old. It's not prior to zoning, that's for sure. Everybody's favorite orthodontist, I believe. Um, but here's this young man uh, walking on an asphalt sidewalk that is basically part of the same roadway here. Um, uh, it's a fairly fast moving, highly trafficked road. The entrance here uh, to, the, to the driveway where the parking area is, you know, is heavily used. There's, there's a car kind of parked in the what should be a front yard for the building potentially, or at least a side yard. So the challenges of a place like this are, are fairly apparent. 
And when we work on these in the future, when changes happen in places like this, we want to, to improve the quality of that public realm as well as improving the quality of their own space. So what are we trying to achieve here? Well, number one on the list, and we've heard it loud and clear, it's in your written documents like your plan, is really it's all about uh, preserving the character of the existing community. So if we want to do that, we've got to tackle some measures that make new activity better neighbors for the existing community. We also, from our perspective, um, uh, are hearing a call for more options for homeowners. So we've got a little poster up there that says, let's make Concord work for you. And on that poster are examples of both sides of the equation. In this case, we've got this older woman who originally owned the main house, and she's kind of tired of going to the upstairs bedroom. She can't really handle it anymore. She wants some modern conveniences, a new kitchen, uh, you know, whatever else. So she builds herself the smaller cottage unit in the back, and then she's leasing the main house to her son and his lovely wife. And they get to live in town somewhere as well. This is a, a long-term multi-generational solution for that particular site. And it helps both the homeowner and the newcomer, the incomer. We also might have an example of, of this young man who bought this lovely older house and you know started fixing it up and discovered it was a lot more room than he needed and maybe it was a lot more expensive to fix up than maybe he realized. So he decided to split it up and offer portions of the house to rent for other people. And so now this young mother who's been commuting to Concord from Pittsfield every day is able to live in town in a smaller space in an existing house in an existing neighborhood. So in addition to sort of those, those policy challenges, this zoning ordinance also needs to be something easier to understand, something that is transparent about what the rules are, both to the boards and commissions and the staff who are administering it, but also to the general public, because that will make code enforcement easier, that will make new development activity easier, will get better plans in the first time. Uh, uh, and. I have never truly understood why we always had zoning written by attorneys because then all we got was the text version because that's their world is text. When in fact the world most people are working in is with an architect or a designer or something else, somebody who's visual by nature. So we want a more illustrated code in our next version and perhaps a little less on the lawyerly language and a little more on the plain English. So how can we do all of these things? Well, first off, the neighborhoods have to be custom tailored. Whenever zoning was put in place here and the original districts were put in place, there wasn't any look at what was on the ground. There were numbers applied like lot areas or lot widths or setbacks that had nothing to do with what was actually there. There were a somewhat idealized palette of, you know, large, medium, small, you know, whatever they were, um, but they weren't, they weren't a decent fit. So the first thing we've got to do, this, this example in the center is out of our original assessment. All of these brown lots were non-conforming or substandard under the current code. So more than half of the neighborhood doesn't meet the rules. And yet, if we went and looked at that neighborhood, we'd say, that's a lovely Concord neighborhood, right? I'd like to live there. It's just fine. So. One of the first challenges is to revise the numbers to make these neighborhoods function as they are and be able to add new houses or new housing opportunities within those neighborhoods. Expanding the options for the property owners. Once we make those lots, more of those lots conforming, then let's give people some options. So right now, state law says you have to allow an accessory dwelling unit. Concord chose to provide that accessory dwelling unit only in the main house right now. So I can't do this one. I would have to do it this way, attach it to the main house, right? Not a terrible imposition perhaps, but in terms of living situations and whatever else, 
This is actually in your ordinance today required to have an interior door that goes into the main unit and some other kinds of things that make it maybe great for multi-generational living, but not if you're necessarily renting to one of the students at the law school or someone else. So providing options um, uh, all the way from the large house all by itself to something that's split down the middle into a duplex to something that has a, a, a main house and a back house or a main house and attached accessory unit. Um, all of those options are good for homeowners. They provide additional income. They provide opportunities to bring your family together. They provide opportunity in general. What we have done is we have tried very hard to level the playing field across the community in terms of the housing options available. So what we've really said is there are small units, medium units, large units, and extra large units. And based on the amount of land that you've got, you get access to those, right? So if we get this calibrated right, you'll get a house and maybe the rear unit in terms of your value. So that would be the house might be this size at 0.75 and the back house might be 0.25, a modest cottage in the backyard. And that equals one and that might be the value associated with a certain lot size. So trying to provide options for people. You could also split the house into 2.5s uh, or you can if you can afford it, if you happen to be able to afford it, you can retain the large house all to yourself. That's also an option. There's nobody making people chop their house up or anything else, right? These are options for people who, who would make their own investment choices about their own property. Leveling the playing field in the same form as well. So one is the actual housing changing. Here we're talking about changing the form. Here's the extra large home at one unit value. And here's two medium homes, perhaps split in two, right? You've got lots of duplexes in this town, perhaps more than you even think. Um, if you go look for, the, look for the electric meters on the side of the house, that's the best way to figure out how many units are in the house. Um, and the assessor doesn't necessarily have it right all the time. Um, or it could be four small homes, right? These at, at 750 square feet a piece could be four or two at 1,500 square feet a piece or one at 3,000 square feet a piece. They should be put on parity if we possibly can because that um, gives options for people who can only afford 750 square feet to be in this community, right? To be in theoretically most of the neighborhoods of this community. So. This project also goes beyond the residential piece, and so I want to talk just for a moment about uh, some of the commercial piece. So this is what would be considered neighborhood commercial. And I know that this is the beloved site of a former grocery store, which is now a Rite Aid, which is a, a, a powerful attractor in this neighborhood. And I don't mean to necessarily pick on any one piece, but it's just a poster child. So. It's sitting here with a long blank wall along the street, very little landscaping. The widest entrance driveway for one of these uses I think I've ever seen, I think it's wider than this street for, you know, so there's plenty of room to go into that parking lot at full speed. Um, not a good thing for the pedestrians crossing this sidewalk. Um, uh, the parking lot was never screened and it doesn't appear to be shaded by trees at all. So there are some elements that are missing from what we might consider good current development. If we rebuilt this building or a replacement for it on this site, it should have more windows along the street. It should have more landscaping and a formal streetscape. It should have a narrower driveway. It should have a screened parking lot that is set back from the edge of the road. And those are simple decisions that humanize this setting. This is the place that is the closest to my neighborhood to walk to and spend time in. And yet, it's really set up for me to drive there. Right? So what does all of this look like? How do we get to these ideas that we're talking about? Well, here's an example. So this today is zone uh, RN. It's that house right there, and here it is. 
And unfortunately, again, the rules say, oh, that house is breaking all of our rules, half of our rules, sorry, they did get a few checks. So when I look back at this picture, I say, wow, it kind of looks like that house fits in just fine. So the first thing we're going to do is calibrate the rules to fit that house, right? And that means the actual code pages are, are going to change and the, what we call the metrics, the standards for lot width, lot area, side setbacks, all of those things are going to be based off the patterns that we see in general in these neighborhoods. And they are different across town, right? Lots are smaller and tighter houses are smaller over here. Uh, lots here are big and wide and we have ranch homes and therefore they're much wider side to side. Um, so we have different patterns and we are going to have different districts to accommodate those. On each of the pages then though, we're going to get uh, uh, rules for the lot, rules for the building itself, rules for accessory buildings on the property, the placement of parking, how roofs and the length of buildings, in this case the length facing the street is the most important, right? On smaller lots, the building's going to have to go deeper into the site. On larger lots, the building can turn around and go sideways onto the street, right? Those are patterns you see out there today. Um, and finally, windows and doors. These are things that we're going to regulate consistently throughout the residential districts and on into the mixed-use districts. Some of the same kinds of things, but turning the dials for those metrics to make them fit the patterns you have today. So part of the conversation that we want to have is about how to make these things fit successfully into your neighborhood. So if you've got the time, we want you to look at the proposed zoning map, have a look at which district that would put you in, talk to one of us this evening about what those numbers would be. Uh, we could theoretically look up on the assessor's database how big your lot is. We can measure out how big your house is and tell you what else you could do. Could I do a unit in the back? Do I have too much lot coverage already to do that? Do I, am I non-conforming in some other way according to your new rules? Or actually have I been brought into conformity and life has made easier for me? We all, we, so we'd like you to talk to our team tonight. Uh, we'd like you to fill out a comment card if you're uncomfortable talking to us about something in particular. You can certainly email uh, Heather to ask questions, even of us, it'll get on back to us. We'd like you to download the draft. Uh, I am gonna talk about the draft timing in just a moment. Um, you can provide written comments uh, uh, when we uh, have posted a new draft. And in the future, you can attend the Planning Board or City Council meetings to either support this concept or support changes to this concept that make it work better for you. So all of those are possibilities. Let me talk just briefly about the, the drafting process. We've learned a lot during this trip already. We're gonna learn a little more tonight with you here. So we are gonna make a revised draft. The draft that's posted right now, there is one posted on conquerednext.info. The draft that's posted today has like placeholders from some of the graphics and has some questions in it still. We'll answer those based on our visit here on this trip. And within the next week or so, we're gonna post a revised draft, we hope. Um, when that revised draft is posted, we'll send around kind of an e-blast to people who are interested. And you'll get a chance then to formally provide written comments if you'd like to. The zoning map. Yes. Is the zoning map it's up. available? It is. Yep, that version is up. We, I'm pretty sure we put it up. Yep. It's up on the ConcordNext.info site, I'm pretty sure. Look, look at the, um, work your way down through the most recent posts. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure it's in there. And if not, we'll get it up by tomorrow morning. Um, so, um, I have year two, I was just gonna finish year two. Is that okay? Okay, so, ooh, unfortunately, this map is, is uh, a little washed out for you to understand it. But you can see these gray areas. This is uh, up where Wheelabrator used to be, and what's the new development called for the Fresh Market? Whitney Road development is occurring. Um, that was supposed to be something we were going to help plan in year two. We didn't get there in time, and so um, some of that's being planned actively right now. Uh, but the, uh, the corridor on the way up to Penacook, um, some of the little neighborhood centers on the way, uh, north of downtown, 
the north and south ends of the Opportunity Corridor and those performance districts, including the mall site, those are places where it's not just a technical exercise of looking at the existing patterns, but they actually have opportunities beyond that and a little bit of planning needs to be done in those places. And so once we have kind of dealt with everything that's in color on there, we're going to go back and deal with the things that are in white, which are these things marked here. So those things in white are um, the office park district, uh, gateway performance, um, general commercial, uh, a few of the other districts were not included in this round. So those are, are coming. So if you see a white area, it just means more planning thinking needs to be done before the zoning for those particular areas can be done. Doesn't keep us from, from adopting this piece if we choose to, whenever it's ready. We can always use the old piece for those areas and the new piece for the areas that we're ready for. So it could be that we might be moving towards uh, 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 something before the end of the year that could be adopted that would help out the residential districts and the other mixed-use districts uh, beyond those that are white. Um, so did I miss anything, Heather? Sure, come on up. So I just I wanted to get into the weeds just a little bit to explain how, if you don't mind, no. explain how um, the new re uh, regulatory standards would work. So currently. Um, what you can do on your lot is basically regulated by lot coverage and whether or not you can do a single family, a duplex, a multifamily, um, your setbacks, your frontage, those types of things. And as Lee said, a lot of what we have is not conforming. So we now have what we propose, um, and, and you, when you look up there, uh, I'll be there to explain it in more detail, but we, we propose districts that have 5,000 square foot minimum lot, lot minimums, 7,500 7, square foot lot minimums, 10,000 square foot lot minimums, where those did not exist before. So now we've got entire areas that are much more conforming with very minimal non-conformities. Um, yes, there are still some lots that are just so tiny, they're never going to conform no matter what we do. Um, so we've got districts that are defined by much much smaller lot sizes, much smaller lot frontages, um, which creates the conformity. Um, then the other measure that's going to be regulating what you can do on your site is this idea of the unit type that Lee went over. Um, so the difference between the districts is not just the lot size and the frontage, but also how much unit type you can get per thousand square feet. So our base unit type is this 0.25, which Lee mentioned, um, that goes up in increments of 0.25. So uh, the 0.25 correlates with a certain amount of, of square footage. So for instance, what we have um, up, up here on the wall, I believe, and, and in the back, there's a few 11 by 17s is a district where the unit type is 0.25 per, I believe it's something like 1,600 square feet. And that corresponds with the 5,000 square foot district. So 1,600 times three, roughly, is about 5,000. And 0.25 times three, roughly, is 0.75. So well, not exactly, 0.75. So in the 5,000 square foot district, if you've got a lot that is 5,000 square feet, you are allowed 0.75 is, is the amount of unit type that you're allowed. So that would break down to something, uh, I think, based on what we proposed. Three, uh, three, 20, small three small units. Three small units. 22, yeah, 2,250 square feet. Or, or a 2,250 <coughs> square foot home. Single family. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah or, or if you want, want to break it up into you know, multiple units inside that. Um, so that's the, those are the new metrics for how we're thinking about how much and what can go on a lot. And what that allows is a lot more flexibility and a lot uh, in terms of how much you can put on your lot. And so the goal is to match what's there, uh, but also allow others in the neighborhood to do what's already there. So uh, we chose today, this is an exercise that we did today, and we're going to be doing much more of these exercises across the city to make sure that we got the numbers right, is uh, was on Alvin Street, which is sort of in the northwest, close into downtown, sort of north of... Um, uh, the, the church site that was recently taken down you know, by the cemetery over there. So we picked that street, and what we did was we put down, and you can check, check it out over there, on each lot, uh, the, the square footage of the lot, how much unit they already have, and how much they're allowed. Um, so this was a really valuable exercise, I felt, because it showed that what I felt in this particular neighborhood, that we kind of got it right. What it shows is that um, in some, in, for some of the lots, they have as much as they're allowed to have. For other lots, they have less, and they would be able to put one of these small ADUs or an addition on their house or something more in the back. 
and for other lot and for a few other lots, they had more than they would be permitted. So those folks would not be able to to, to uh, put any more on their property. And so if you go and you look, it, it, they're written on each of the lots, and you can see for yourself whether or not you agree with those conclusions. That yes, this lot has a little bit too much. This lot's just right, and everybody should be able to do this. And this lot, you know, they've chosen not to maximize, but if they chose to someday, they could. Um, so I intend to do that with uh, many different streets throughout the neighborhoods to make sure that, that that's the kind of balance that we want. That it's mostly good, that there's some people who can do more. That Goldilocks house, right? Perfect. And that there's some, that there's always going to be some that already have too much. Um, so that's, that's what we're going to be doing to test drive this. Mm -hmm. And that's what we need mm -hmm. feedback, I think, from, from the public from in terms of how what they think about their neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, and there's some graphics over there showing what that street looks like for those of you who um, can't call it to mind. Um, so I just wanted to sort of give a, a I know that was a lot of information in the weeds, um, but that's that's the direction that we're going, and that's what I think we need some feedback on to make sure that we're getting those numbers right. Which doesn't mean that we can't, moving forward, even after we draft it, say, you know Change what, those numbers. Yeah, yeah, we're having issues with here, and we need to adjust that. Because this isn't intended to, to be that we're done, and we don't touch it again for another decade. Um, because there's, there's probably going to need to be, you know, we're going to keep need to, like, moving forward, make sure that we've got it right. So I think Heather and I would like to answer some questions, uh, if we could. Tom. So the, the, first of all, the June 14, 2019 Ozone District map is on the website. It's, Thank you. It's all up there. Great. Question, uh, I'm going to jump right to the end. Okay. Which is, um, obviously this, this process and this, this logic has worked in other parts of the country and been very successful. Are you also going to bring us a proposed administrative apparatus that goes along with it? Yes. Because this will be a this will be a, take a generation to permeate the community. Right? Yes. Right. So how do you, you know, if, if people left her on their own, there might be a few really good architects like a Carly or somebody like that who will figure this out and how to apply this in different places. But but if left to the general person, this would be a little, even still a little too complex. Understood. So a couple of things. Um, one, before we walk away, when we get to the adoption process, adoption hearings are typically in the evening. We often take advantage of the fact that we're actually here during the day and we train people. We train staff and we train especially outside professionals. So we want all those architects to come see us or, or the developers themselves or their landscape architect or their surveyor or whoever they work with, we want to have that conversation with them and get them immersed in the new model. When it seems imminent, they are usually ready to come talk to us about that. So, so that's certainly one. Two, I think an important thing, to unlock the potential of a system like this, you typically review development at the staff level. So we've got to think about making sure that minor site plans are more minor, not the same thing as a major site plan. Major site plans still go up to the planning board where they should go, but a minor site plan can be reviewed by the technical staff, right? All of the technical staff, including engineering and planning and building, et cetera. Site plans get reviewed up to those four units in-house because those come on a single family lot, if you will, you know what we used to call a single family lot. It's actually a two family lot already today, courtesy of the state legislature. We've now talking about making it a three or four family lot, potentially. Well, just, to, just to follow up on that, the, the Concord has a, uh, a culture of if anybody does anything anywhere, everybody knows about it before it happens. Yes. Right? So, and everybody is notified, there's public meetings about it, we talk about it for a few years, and then we go do it. Um, in this case, if things are going to be done in-house, and I've done that process in the past, you know, peop people in neighborhoods are going to see things happening in their neighborhoods, and they're going to, the first question to their city council or somebody else is going to be, I wasn't notified of that. So, so how do, you, how do the, you make those things work? Yes. So I've been thinking about this pretty strongly, pretty heavily for a long time now, um, because I recognize that we had some there needs to be a difference between the minor site plan process and the major site plan process. And right now, in terms of submission requirements and all the hoops they have to jump through, they're, they're very similar. However, the, uh, New Hampshire has given the planning board the ability to delegate uh, their abilities to a technical review committee, which we have not made use of in Concord hardly at all, um, because 
if you need to go to the technical review committee, you, you, you can't need a waiver. And right now our regulations are so complicated for a minor site plan that you almost always need a waiver, and so you're kicked out of the TRC process. So I think part of the challenge, and, and what, I'm slowly wrapping my mind around the solution, which is we want to capture more in the TRC process, which you are still notified for a public hearing for. You still have a public hearing. It's just not before the planning board may or may not be in this room, but it's similar to the way we do some of the other notifications for the public. So we want to capture more in the TRC process, make it simpler for people, and then we would still be notifying the planning board at the end of the month, this is, these are the things that we did under your authorization. And by the way, if those people disagree with anything that's decided, they can appeal to the planning board. So that's in process already in New Hampshire. So we just have to change where those controls are, change where those triggers are, and change what those requirements are so that people aren't getting tripped up and kicked into uh, planning board public hearing every single time they want to do a lot line adjustment. Right it, it's also irresistible to, to explain to you our experience in other communities, which is the single most effective notice is a sign in the front yard. A sign in the front yard catches everybody's attention in the neighborhood. If they drive that street, if they walk their dog down that street, if they whatever, it, it catches their attention. So that is the best mechanism. So whether the conversation is happening at the staff level or whatever else, it can benefit from public comment from people. It can benefit from uh, people who want to be engaged in, and understand what's going on. Um, so uh, good website you know, information available to them and then a sign in the front yard are probably the most effective things that you can do. The news will go around like wildfire once you post that sign. Yes, sir. In the case of form-based um, zoning, which is what you're talking about here, if I'm not misusing that term, how do you deal with change? How do you deal with the evolution of neighborhoods, say, from single-family to more intense multifamily, from one kind of commercial development to another kind of commercial development? Because obviously, these changes happen, and in many cases, they're desirable or just inexorable. So how does, how does the form-based code address the possibility that the existing pattern is not the future pattern? Mm -hmm. So that's probably the biggest difference between the white places right this minute and the not white places, is that the white places have a pattern or a plan for a pattern, like the Opportunity Corridor has a plan, um, that we felt we could rely on and code for. And the white places need planning today before new zoning is put in place. If you wanted to change the rules for Penacook in five years based on activity that's begun to happen for whatever reason up there, do a little area plan, rethink it, replace the zoning. Step up a category or two you know, in terms of the intensity, et cetera. So there'd be options uh, to do that all along. But from our perspective, you either need to be looking at the pattern and matching that. Even if you're intensifying it, you're still looking at the pattern that's there today. Or you need to be planning for transformational change. So, for example, if you look near the downtown area, the shoulders of the downtown are set up to look at in year two to plan for transformational change because they kind of need it. They can't decide whether they're commercial corridors in the outlying area or part of the downtown or, you know, and right this minute they're neither beast nor fowl and they need to figure out what they want to be when they grow up and then we can zone for that. And it will be a pattern different than what's on the ground today. I pretty much guarantee it, right? Because what has come on the ground is parking lots in front of suburban buildings within a block or two of your relatively pristine downtown. Uh, so there's a new pattern that needs to be applied in those places and confirmed with the general public and then coded for. So those white areas for the moment are exactly what you're talking about. They have a future which is different from today and it needs to be decided and determined by the community, vetted through the planning board and approved and adopted through city council. So that to me is the model. Um, I'm working in Los Angeles with a 1946 ordinance 
that has never been fully replaced since 46. We've just begun working in Cleveland, and did you say 1927? 29. 29, okay, a couple years off. 1929 ordinance brought forward to today. Actually, it might have been better than some of today's ordinances. I don't know, we've accreted a lot of stuff over the years. But part of the point is the ordinance itself should be a 20-year lifespan, and within that, you should probably have replanned some areas every five or 10 years, right? Because they'll be changing at that pace. Um, so, so I, I mean, I think the answer is, you know, plan and then code for those kinds of places where we're transforming areas or where change has already happened in the neighborhood and now we're realizing that we're gonna take it to the next level, whatever that might be. You're never done building a city. This is a beautiful quote, which I've discovered somewhere. I've heard the term build out in more cities, you know, and it's like, is Rome built out? Is Paris built out? they're still building stuff there. And many times it's bigger and different and maybe more contemporary, a different architectural style, etc. We're never gonna be done here either, right? So how does the city morph in ways that are sensitive to the existing character and retain enough character as we go into that future? That's, that's what we're hoping to build here for you. And we need you to help us turn the dials to get that right, if that helps. Yes, of course. Part of your question about how does it handle changes such as a single family neighborhood transitioning to a, a more dense neighborhood. And I think those types of changes in terms of how neighborhoods may change in that way are really baked in and part of the purpose of, of what we're doing here. Um, because the form based standards are intended to protect the integrity of the neighborhood, but the flexibility with the unit types that we're proposing are allowed by right. So we're not gonna have a section where you have a single family district and only a single family home is allowed. You're gonna have a district that has minimum lot size and a unit uh, value that's assigned based on your lot size. And you can put whatever unit type, uh, or you can transform your home into accommodating whatever unit type that you like. So it's designed to protect the integrity of the physical characteristics of the neighborhood, but allow you to do that transition. That's sort of just baked into what we're doing right here. Yes, sir. So, um, in neighborhoods that traditionally single family residential now, all, you know, all of them um, uh, could be, you know, could have a secondary the unit, unit, unit uh, but the owner has to live in one of those units. If you start to break it up into three or four units. I could think of some neighborhoods where that may never be an issue, but I could also think of neighborhoods where absentee um, ownership um, not only currently creates a problem, but in the future, because somebody can look at a, um, an undervalued house um, and say, geez, I'm going to knock that down. I have the opportunity to put in three units here. Um, it's an underperforming neighborhood, um, and now we create, um, we added to the problems in that neighborhood. Um, now that I've given you a loaded question, what are your thoughts or, or suggestions about um, uh, homeowner or somebody who, uh, an owner of the property, living on the property in, in areas that were traditionally single uh, family residences? So part of the challenge is you can be a bad apple today. You can be a single family home uh, well, let's pick on everybody's favorite to pick on. Rented to six college students, for example, or something like that. And, you know, having 12 cars on the site and whatever else. That can happen today. So we still have the, we are not exacerbating the risks of what happens. The state already gave you two units per site. We're talking about giving you the opportunity, potentially, if you have enough land area for three or four units, but we're not fundamentally changing the character and saying, no, uh, all of this goes and we're gonna get big apartment blocks next to your small house. So the controls on the form help a lot, but there is the chance in any form, anywhere, in an apartment form, in a house form, in a anything else form for bad actors. How do you manage those? The same way we should manage any other challenge. We have code enforcement, and then theoretically, if all else fails, we have the police. And those are our only options. So early days, should you be perhaps a little extra vigilant 
about code enforcement and management of some of these so that you get started off on the right track? Perhaps. Kevin, thank you. By kind of uh, opening this up a little bit, you might also see a lot more investment in areas where you're seeing lack of investment, kind of more um, absent landlords and things like that. Um, and that investment in the neighborhood alone is going to is going to kind of change the change the uh, character not the character of the neighborhood, but change the uh, the profile of the of the homeowners and the tenants and things like that. Not to be you know not to be different income level or anything like that, but a different um, a different uh, attention to the community, and you know their home is going to be more maintained. There's going to be investment in the current structure more likely because uh, they're not getting a ton of extra development uh, potential on their lot necessarily to knock it down and build an apartment building. They still have to build within the form of the, the community. So you're you're getting kind of within the same form. You might actually get reinvestment in a neighborhood that are not seeing as much investment. Yes. Yeah. One, one, of the, one, one thing that surprised me what, in doing the analysis of the community and, and the different neighborhoods is how much of the city is already zoned multifamily or duplex, and yet how much single family development we still have. So there's some prevailing assumption in the development world is that the highest you zone something, that's what it's going to develop to. But for instance, much, most of Pentecook is zoned for multifamily or duplex, yet most of Pentecook is single family homes. Um, so just because we're giving people these options and giving them these opportunities um, and giving them this flexibility doesn't mean that there's going to be some massive, you know, shift or change. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're actually hoping that people will take advantage of some of these opportunities to provide more housing that we need in the community. Um, but a large part of Concord is still single-family homes because that's that's what we are. Those are market choices. Right, yeah. that's what people are doing. Um, so I just wanted to uh, and, add that. And just to put some numbers to that, Seattle, after 10 years of having accessory dwelling units available, only 5% of the lots that were eligible to use them had built them after 10 years. It, it's not change that's going to instantly happen overnight. You might see more of it in an underinvested neighborhood simply because that's the easiest entry into the marketplace for people. But if you have trouble with absentee landlords today, you're going to have trouble with absentee landlords in the future. You need a process to manage absentee landlords and, and code enforcement to make sure that they play nice just like everybody else. Other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, we've been talking a lot about um, individuals and their use of individual lots. Yes. I was curious. Um, if as part of this plan there's a revamping of some of the uh, some other concepts such as PUDs or uh, places uh, for potential conquered investment, uh, the parks, parking garages, things of that nature to, to achieve some of these um, aspirational goals such as density that you mm -hmm. So uh, planned unit development is set aside for the moment. We haven't decided totally what to do with it and whether it is a tool that will continue to exist. The flexibility that was once allowed in planned unit development had to do with the fact that things were kind of zoned wrong. So if they get zoned right, can they build under the rules? Um, perhaps. Um, uh, as you know, uh, uh, there are some interesting things going on. The church redevelopment that's going on. Uh, uh, you know, how do we make that happen? Well, we started looking at that under the new rules and most of the conversations that are being held today about that project would still be held under the new rules because it's a challenging site and, and uh, it's challenging to fit things on it. Now, the larger scale questions of um, how can we open up the opportunity corridor and really get some activity down there, not just single story, but you know more intense, et cetera. Those ones remain a little bit unanswered. The zoning will be in place for a portion of the corridor that's right behind downtown, but the ends of the corridor, not quite fully baked what the concept might be for how those might become players in the downtown area, uh, but clearly, if there are, is going to be structured parking anywhere, it's going to be in a very intense environment. That means the closest to the downtown core, or potentially if the mall site becomes a wholly new thing, 
you know, at a site like that. Uh, and otherwise, we'll probably be surface parking. We'll be tucking under parking. We'll be, you know, doing deck options maybe, but full-on parking structures are a pretty expensive model, and so much harder to produce those in this marketplace. Um, nothing precludes them. There will be rules for how they get developed, um, um, uh, but we are certainly not expecting substantial you know new drop-in kinds of things that that somehow demand those there are areas of the town that could accommodate it the former office park section that's in year two planning is a great example of of you know where some of that might happen both to the south and southeast um, uh, down there those white areas um, and the mall site all of those are are um, real significant parcel scales and, and, and chances to rethink whole block and street networks along with thinking about individual properties. Um, so I think the tools are set up to think about those areas and we're actually going to test them in the year two work. We're going to design some things that would follow the rules and fit them on there and let people look at them and say, you know, would these be the kinds of rules? Would this be the kind of outcome that you're looking for? So. We're hoping to get there um, uh, on those newer think areas, the transformational areas, as well as the individual lots in the older portion of town. There was a question back here. Yes. Well, a lot of the examples you've talked about tonight um, yes. certainly apply in our kind of urban core. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about how the form-based approach would apply in our, our own, what's currently our, our own districts, where the character of the neighborhood so RO is another one of those neither beast nor fowl neighborhoods. And I don't mean to offend anyone, but your uh, cluster provisions aren't generating what most people would prefer to see in the countryside, if you will. Uh, many of the older subdivisions were simply you know, cut out on the existing roads, driveway after driveway after driveway. The house is actually up near the road. It doesn't feel a whole lot different than being in town. You don't feel that boundary when you've, when you've crossed over into the RO area necessarily as clearly as you might expect based on the fact that there's supposed to be two acre lots and whatever else. As so much of that two acre lot is somehow, you know, well off the road somewhere and it's treed and we're not even aware of it. So cluster done right might look a little different than what's out there. Now, one of the things we did do on this map, and it might morph and change a little bit, but that lightest green on the proposed zoning district map, that lightest green is the existing conservation layer in the GIS. It may need to be adjusted to be absolutely accurate, but one of the points that I made when I first came to the community was your, that map on the left makes it look like you have immense areas available for OS development. When in fact, by the time you look on the right and you add in the creek buffers and you add in the wetlands and whatever else, there's very little opportunity for significant new uh, RO development. We've, um, we've called it ROS in, in the new code, calling it open space. Uh, and we're hoping to improve the quality of clusters, do a better job connecting the habitat together out there, do a better job perhaps buffering along the roadway, and perhaps even more tightly clustering to the extent that we can under the septic tank regulations, um, some of that activity out there. But um, fundamentally, there's not gonna be a lot of it, um, uh, and so there'll be slightly new rules. Now, right this moment, we are proposing to use the same options there. So one of the intriguing things to my mind that could happen is you might have a slightly larger site, larger than the minimum uh, acreage, and you could get a set of cottages out there instead surrounding an open space. And if we could get approved through the state, you know, some community septic, you could have a very interesting small development that sits within the forest out there and away from the road and is really a lovely isolated cluster of smaller houses that would make rural living more affordable close to the city. 
right? Instead of having to drive and drive to get that cheap piece of land. So there are some options that might be available to people that might actually generate some intriguing outcomes out there. Um, it's also possible that many of those sites are far larger than the minimum lot size and therefore might get an additional accessory unit out there. So, you know, adding on the possibility for multi-generational living or somebody might be willing to build the bigger house and put their multi-generations in the same house with them. Um, uh, so there are some things that could happen out there that would be positive, but the amount of change out there is still modest um, minus access to sewer, they're not going to get higher densities. Uh, and that kind of line in the sand is going to stay drawn there of, of sort of the urbanized area and the surrounding countryside. Go ahead. Can I just add to that? Um, so just to clarify, in case it didn't come across, so we're adding a new conservation district. Um, so that's what these areas are. It basically calls out, hey, these are areas that are under easement. So they can't have residential development on them. Um, so again, we have to look at that layer to make sure we have everything that's supposed to be on there. Um, you know, we may not have things like state forest because that's not actually under easement, it's just owned by the state. So we're still looking at what should and shouldn't be in that layer. Um, we were trying to get rid of the overlays because overlays are just confusing. So we have a new district which is the watershed district. So this would be the, ne the next least dense. <laughs> Um, because these are four acre minimums in the watershed. So this is now not an overlay, it's an actual district because just about every single regulatory standard is different in the watershed overlay. So let's just make it a district. Um, and it's one of the only districts that just by nature doesn't follow the property boundaries because it actually literally follows the watershed. Um, so then after that, we've got our typical uh, open space district, which is what we all think of. And it's, it's not changing you know, very little. Um, when Lee says the cluster is not working, he's mostly thinking in, in terms of all of the people taking advantage of the cluster provisions to do minor subdivisions, yes. um, which is, results in frontage lots along the street, and a lot of those lots couldn't do anything different anyway, so they're kind of getting a benefit and an advantage and, and more lots um, simply because they're sort of utilizing this. So one of the uh, thoughts is to get rid of cluster for minor subdivisions and only require them basically, or require slash allow them for major subdivisions. So keeping that provision in there for, for the cluster, but not allowing people to take advantage of it for the, for the minor subdivisions. Um, I think that's the main thing I wanted to say. So there is one other district that's outside the urban growth boundary. Today we have also RM out there, which is considered medium density residential without sewer. Um, so that's kind of an odd district because RM with sewer is actually like two times denser than the RS district. So it's, it's an odd, duck that we've done away with. Um, so now we have a R10, which is the equivalent of the previous RM without a sewer. So those are basically the districts that are that will be outside the urban growth boundary. Other questions? Go ahead. So I'm, I see that the giving people the opportunity to you know, do more things in their lot is, is a good thing. I, I like the idea that there can be more concentrated living. Um, what I am concerned about, though, is the pressure that that puts on the public space. For example, the sidewalks and the streets. So if you're expecting, anticipating more vehicles, more traffic, then that puts more pressure to, to do more of the same of what um, a city might do, uh, providing more places to drive. But what I don't see and I'm concerned about is how does this, how does this leverage in a different way, the public space, so that um, the, the commons that we all share, and, and maybe somebody walking down the sidewalk, how does foreign based code improve their the walkability of neighborhoods and the um, that public space? Mm -hmm. Are there expectations, or um, you know, beyond the individual property owner boundaries? How does this impact what the city then chooses to do? Are there mechanisms that other people have used um, so that the public space doesn't get degraded? And I think uh, this gentleman, you answered a bit in, in his question about you know providing public parks and that sort of thing. Sort of so on the lot by lot example, the best we typically do 
and it's required. If you look at the individual page there, that large blown up page, you'll see one of the first pieces on there is streetscape. So we've got street tree planting, improvement to the sidewalk in front of that particular house, right? So there is, from our perspective, an obligation for all property owners making substantial investment in their property. And I would say a new unit is, maybe a renovation might not be, open question. Um, but whatever those triggers are, at a certain point, you will be triggering streetscape adjacent to your property. Fixing the sidewalk, perhaps even widening the sidewalk and street tree construction. Is the responsibility of the property owner? Yes. Or? Okay. Yes. So even now, though it might be in the right of way of the it, city, it would be the property owner that yes. Okay. yes. Yes. On a case by case basis. And of course, over time, then the city might choose to come back in and you know patch in the missing pieces. Um, it's often done, and now I'll admit, often when that's done, they front foot assess the actual property owners that benefit from that um, uh, in, a, in the interest of equity. Um, uh, but, but yes, on a case-by-case -case basis, hopefully each development, and especially the commercial development, would actually be substantially improving the setting and, and, and not, not degrading it. Now, are we putting more people in the neighborhood park? And is that maybe a challenge? Yes. Is there a mechanism for dealing with that? Well, no. Improved value, more property tax, theoretically, you know, but that's a, that's a not a direct connection like perhaps you were looking for. So there's not, right this minute, there's not a value capture mechanism to, to uh, grab onto that assessed value and make improvements on behalf of the neighborhood. That's part of the standard CIP planning process. If we saw a lot of activity in one particular neighborhood, if the south end is somehow all of a sudden, you know, the hot place, does the CIP get a little more focused there? Probably. But that's your typical process of spending public money. Um, so, no, there's not a great mechanism. Now, within an individual development, especially a large-scale development, we can achieve those things within that development. New streets, new streetscape, you know, new water and sewer, all of those kinds of things can come with each development, especially the larger scale activity. Go ahead. I'm going to temper some of the things that we just said, um, simply because I think that it's very common in many other parts of the world for the property owner, like a residential property owner, perhaps, to make those improvements. I don't know if that would fly in New Hampshire or in our community. I think for bigger projects, we assume that they're going to take care of the streetscape. Um, especially commercial projects, and especially, uh, but also for uh, residential projects when it's, for instance, a multifamily building, and they may have to cur close curb cuts and reconstruct sidewalks and things like that, and we may want them to plant street trees. Uh, but I don't want anyone to go away thinking, geez, if I upgrade my house, they're going to make me, you know, fix the sidewalk, because it's not the intention for some, some smaller projects or for residential people to have to do things like that. Um, I'll also add that we is absolutely astonished and horrified that the city is responsible for plowing everyone's sidewalks <laughs> because this is not something that would occur in almost anywhere else that he's that he's worked because it's the property owner's responsibility yes. to do yes. all of that stuff yes. so there are some different balances in terms of the expectations from private to public um, so we do tend to do things a little different you're special here. people up and here I in new hampshire sure, i don't want anyone to walk away saying well heck with that, we're not doing that. But so those are sort of ongoing conversations about where those lines are, what types of projects those might be for. Um, when I looked at some of those streetscape standards, I was assuming when somebody's going to build a new street, or even when the city's going to build a new street, or, or you know, private developers going to build a new street, these are the standards that we would expect them to adhere to. Um, so just wanted to put that in some New England perspective. Mm -hmm. No worries. Um, we'd be glad to answer more questions. We're hoping you'll actually kind of go give a, a bent eye to the posters that we've got up, especially as uh, uh, Heather suggested, the one all the way on the far right. Now that block face that we looked at, I don't know, it's about 10 houses. Two could do more units than are on the site now. Two are completely over the limit and the rest meet. I think we got the calibration for that particular district about right, but have a look, see what you think. 
Um, uh, and we'll have more of those over time. We'll post those on the website once we've got some of this testing done and let you guys weigh in on whether you think we've actually, you know, turned the dials uh, in all the right directions. So uh, thank you very much for your time so far. Hopefully you'll stick with us in the course of this process. Um, next piece of the draft that comes out is the back half. The back half will have parking and landscaping, some of the key development standards. It will also have the procedural pieces, right? So the technical review committee and how that might function, uh, modification of any triggers for site plan review, et cetera, will be in that next piece. Hopefully we'll be back sometime in July having a same community conversation about that piece. Then we'll put them back together and revise them and uh, try to get them on up to the planning board and eventually to the council. So thank you very much.